Hello, I'm Marcy Tapman. Thanks so much for joining us. A major investigation of Mayor LaToya Cantrell and an associate is raising not only eyebrows, but questions about the mayor's time away from the office, plus the possible misuse of a public facility and overtime billing by a security guard. We will hear tonight from the reporter who broke the story. Elsewhere, Louisiana did not have much impact in last week's national elections, except for the emergence of one of its own as being among Congress's most powerful leaders. Our Future Watch segment looks at mental health issues for teens and kids and the state's low ranking for providing help. And we will take a special look at one of the city's greatest tragedies. November 29th is the 50th anniversary of a high-rise fire that underscored the inadequacy of fighting fires in a tall building. Joining us are tonight's informed sources. Errol Laborde, producer of informed sources. Lee Zorick, investigative reporter and anchor, WVUE-TV, Fox 8. Roy Anderson, independent documentary maker. And Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. We go over to Errol first because I'm taking a look at the, elect uh, the elections. As you said, Louisiana maybe didn't have a great impact, except we have one very powerful member of Congress now. You know, it occurred to me that after this week that there are two people from Louisiana, actually from Metairie, who grew up in Metairie, who are nationally important figures. One is Amy Coney Barrett on the on Supreme Court. That's true. Um, you know, who grew up in Metairie mm -hmm. and um, uh, went to Dominican High School and the other is Steve Scalise, a uh, Metairie guy who went to Jesuit. And so who knows, at some point there were kids and probably in the the same line as a snowball stand together on the <laughs> on the road well right there at the movie. Yeah, I was thinking those have been raised at the time of. I think Scalise did Scalise go to Jesuit or Rummel? Uh, I'm being Rummel. told he went to You're Rummel. You're right. He went to yeah, Rummel. Rummel. He, went to, he went to Rummel. Okay. Uh, the uh, he'd been raised. The book been raised at the time of Harry Lee and Lawrence Shahardi and so Tom Donlin. So they would have seen a, a lot of politics if they were paying attention. Anyway, um, um, Scalise is story would make a, a great book one day. I mean, from having uh, almost died from, uh, uh, from gunshot wounds to That's surviving right. and then uh, winding up. And he was elected unanimously uh, by, the, uh, uh, by his colleagues. So it's an important job. I mean, he, he's the guy that really steers the majority party. The only problem is, is that the majority party doesn't have that much of a majority. And so it's going to be a, a very difficult job. Yeah, and it really does have a strong-willed uh, part of the party in the Freedom Caucus, um, who are apparently are feeling even stronger. So he's going to have to contend with that, and you know the other side of the party too. And their strength might depend a little bit on on Donald Trump, where Trump goes. There are some people think that I know he announced for president this week, but there are some people think that he may be on the way out, but uh, we don't know. But yeah, there is that. But you know, these are politicians, and all politicians have caucuses within themselves. But yeah, there, there is a little internal fighting. But they all stood together on, the, on, the, on this, and so that was good. And so Kevin McCarthy, um, you know, is vying to be the Speaker of the House. We don't know for sure until January. Um, so if he does not, and Steve Scalise is now the House Majority, could he possibly move into it? Conceivably, that? could be. They could have an election, and they could do it. But it kind of seems like that. Kevin McCarthy thinks he's going to be the Speaker of the House now. I mean, he's the guy holding all the press conferences now and talking with a lot of... It's not like it was two weeks ago mm -hmm. where it was, well, maybe, you know, okay. And so it kind of seems like it's heading in that direction. So with, um, with Congressman uh, Scalise now being in the role that he is, and he's been a powerful guy in Congress yeah. for a while, and he's been a very, very well-liked person in Congress, too, that sort of has helped him well, build was, up his he, power. He was whip, which is the power right, position, exactly. too, yeah. So how... What does that mean for Louisiana, to have a, a member of our congressional delegation now in this position? Well, it's a good thing, I guess, uh, especially in, I guess it's just like a Katrina kind of situation. I think you'd be uh, better able to we draw. We don't want to find out yeah, about yeah, that, now. Yeah, uh, better able to draw attention. I mean, obviously they can't favor everything. But, you know, for the Louisiana congressional delegation, there are six members, five of them are Republicans. All Republicans are a little bit more powerful now. Uh, because they're in the majority party. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that helped us. Uh, but in particular, uh, the guy from the Shreveport area, Mike Johnson, right. uh, who's the co-chair of the Republican caucus, 
uh, which is a powerful job too. And so he's he's an emerging star also. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations to Congressman Scalise, certainly yeah. for this big position that he's got. All right. Thanks a lot, Ian. Yeah. Lee, let's go on over to you. And boy, <laughs> your stories this week about Mayor Cantrell um, have just really been causing major waves. Let's say that indeed is a tsunami. If we didn't see the tsunami in Congress, um, what's happening in, in the community in terms of um, just incredulity, really, just wondering what is really going on here. So I'm going to let you talk to us about what you're finding out. Wow, that, that could, go, I could go on for a while just because there's so many layers to it. So look, first we looked at um, you know, her use of the Upper Pataba apartment, and it's a city-owned apartment that you know past mayors have used a lot less frequently than her. She's using it personally, where they have you know stay there maybe a few nights if they had meetings down there or during Mardi Gras or would host meetings there, where she is, you know, essentially living there, handling you know personal business there. And then we we got a, a public camera. So the the French Market Corporation, which is a public entity, has a security camera right in front of the entrance to that apartment. Um, they installed the camera about a year ago while Mayor Cantrell was uh, mayor, and we put in a public records request for a video from that camera. We've got 45 days worth of video. That's what they they kept stored. And when we reviewed that, we noticed uh, one of her security details, one person who's the member of her executive protection team, essentially, an NOPD officer, Jeffrey Vappi, was spending a lot of time in the Upper Pantaba during the workday um, when he was getting paid um, by taxpayers. And then we requested emails and phone records from the mayor and noticed, and her schedule as well, too, and noticed that a lot of time during the workday, um, she was in the Upper Pantaba and not apparently doing city work, wasn't returning emails, wasn't, um, you know, making phone calls. The city uh, says they don't have any other records that show she is. This is some of the pictures mm -hmm. that you can see um, them going in and out. Uh, they were watering plants a lot during the workday. Just to, just to show you that a lot of the activity that was taking place wasn't necessarily work. One day, um, you know, she canceled a few meetings. Uh, they were up there by themselves. They weren't returning. She wasn't returning any emails. And uh, she actually said, you know, I have a personal matter. My phone's disabled, so I can't call, essentially. And they stayed up there for a few more hours together. All right. So this leads to other questions then also in terms of the officer's payroll records mm -hmm. and some billing issues there. Yeah, so I, you know, and a lot of those are actually on the trip. So she, um, she in 2019 and 2020, she never took executive protection on trips with her. Beginning of 2021, she did not take NOPD officers on trips with her to protect her. Uh, Vappi joins the executive protection team in May, late May of 2021. Fast forward five months later to October, and the first time she goes to Scotland, the first time she takes uh, an NOPD officer with her on the trip, the officer is Jeffrey Vappi. So when we looked at uh, payroll records for many of those trips, for example, they would land back in New Orleans, let's just say three in the afternoon, um, and nothing else going on on her schedule or anything like that. She had other security on duty on her schedule when when they got back. Vappi would, uh, you know, more than two or three times, would continue to bill the city for overtime till 9, 10, you know, even 11 o'clock that night. Uh, there's other instances where they would go, you know, they'd be on the, on the road and they would take an Uber back to the hotel. The Uber receipt shows they're at the hotel. They get there at 7 o'clock at night. Uh, he continues to bill for overtime mm. till like 11 o'clock that night. And so do we know, because we, we do know that the, the mayor and her travels had bumped herself up to business of first class, mm -hmm. ultimately she's paid that back. And when he's traveled with her, was that also first class? So we, we know of at least one. There might be two instances where he flew first class with her and the city and taxpayers paid for that. Um, there is one more instance that we had in a story this week where a viewer actually took a snapshot, a picture of them in first mm -hmm. class on a trip back from um, Los Angeles. We don't know who paid for the first class airfare there. Still looking into yes, records on, yes. on that. All right. You also are, are pointing out that um, in terms of uh, the mayor meeting with her staff, like department heads, mm -hmm. 
that's not happening that much. So that's you know so so when we when we saw her in the Pentaba and Vappy there during the workday, we really wanted to take a closer look at her schedule to see you know what city work is being done by this mayor. And look, you know, New Orleans crime issues, street issues. I mean, there's a lot a lot mm -hmm. of issues going on in the city right now. And so what we determined not only is she spending a lot of time at the Pentaba during the workday, she's really not. Um, having as many meetings as, as most taxpayers, I think, expect the mayor to have. Like, she used to have regular weekly department head meetings with all her department heads at once. She hasn't had one of those since, I think, the summer of 2021. Uh, this year, the, the, the department head that handles street repair, streets, all that, she <laughs> met with him only twice, both times back in April. Never met with, never had a scheduled meeting with the sanitation director, the city attorney, safety and permits director, her number of public safety team meetings, meetings has drastically decreased from, you know, three years ago to this year. There was a press conference this week that you attended with the mayor, and um, she made it very clear that she wasn't really pleased to see you. She said, quote, I'm kind of freaked out because you're looking at me so much. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? And so also members of the community who maybe have said, well, wait, you know, so the mayor does this in her time. Look, uh, uh, first of all, we're doing our job. You know, nothing we have done has been inappropriate or wrong. You know, the, 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 this is not surveillance necessarily. Most of this is all basically, it, you know, we went out there a couple times with the camera to try to figure out what was going on. Then there's a public camera. So this is a public records request. That anybody could take that a look from. anybody this could take a look from a, a camera that was actually put into place when LaToya Cantrell was mayor of the city of New Orleans. Um, none of the facts in our stories have been disputed. So I just, you know, I, I stand by our reporting. Mm -hmm. I stand by what we're doing. Um, and, you know, I just let, let's just, as long as we're factually correct, and I, and I know we are, then, then I have confidence in what we're doing. Lee, you had another story about her, her shopping. So, um, so that is uh, the the FBI. We also learned that the uh, the FBI U.S. attorney is investigating the mayor and uh, her image consultant Tanya Haynes, and uh, th there have been at least two subpoenas issued to stores, one uh, a clothing store in New Orleans, Balins, and then one a kitchen and bath store in uh, in Metairie. And, you know, Tanya Haynes, who's her image consultant, would go in there and apparently from our sources, you know, make purchases for Mayor Cantrell, you know, sometimes paying with cash, sometimes splitting the payments between cash and a credit card. Uh, we know about a $17,000 payment at the kitchen and bath store that was split between two credit cards. Uh, so the, you know, the Justice Department is investigating to see if anything, you know, took place here that, uh, you know, was potentially a criminal violation. The, the image consultant um, works typically for her campaign. She She's made about $175,000 in the last three or four years uh, doing image consulting and other things for uh, the mayor's campaign. In terms of campaign funds, particularly in regards to the clothing, is that allowable using campaign so, money? So the, you cannot use it for personal use. Um, the, there may be a little flexibility in some ways. The law is not essentially clear, but there are a few opinions that address it and that definitely say, you know, it, there's very limited times that you can, that can use clothing. Um, so, you know, that, look, we don't know exactly, at least I, through my sources, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling comfortable to report exactly mm -hmm. what they're looking at now. I mean, certainly it's widespread and they're looking at a lot of things. So I think it's that's safe to uh, determine. Besides being, or at least looking like everything's severely unethical, what's illegal? What laws are potentially being broken with all of these actions. So, I mean, you look at the Pentaba, I mean, is there personal use? C could there be tax implications? Um, the NOP, you know, could you be, could a, could a public employee, the NOPD officer, be doing, you know, private, non public things there? You know, during the workday, is he getting paid for, you know, public work while he's not performing public work? Um, there, there's a number of potential things there, I think. And, and look, we don't know if anything. You know, mm -hmm. any violation has happened. That's for, you know, investigators to determine. You know, the, the ones with badges. Um, so we'll see. So um, we mentioned about the, you know, the the flight upgrades and the mayor paying the city back. 
But you also reported this week about hotel rooms, too. Yes, yeah, so the mayor um, has also been upgrading hotel rooms. There was one trip where, you know, I think $1,800 more a suite, a king suite at a hotel that had, you know, the marble in the bathroom, a couple of rooms, all that kind of stuff. Um, that is a violation of the city policy as well, too. The, the language is essentially the same as the airfare as it is to the suite. They also, uh, her security officer and the mayor, um, took a train from New York or Boston to New York, and they upgraded to the first class mm -hmm. seats and the first class train there, the car there. That was an extra, you know, 250 almost dollars there, too. So if there is potential more violations of the city policy that the mayor would essentially probably have to pay back some more money potentially too. No, the the mayor, you know, fights back saying, "Look, look, I'm I'm working 24/7 mm -hmm. for the for the city, and there's a recent report that shows that New Orleans is really moving ahead, one of the top 10 cities." Where do we find this report? What, where is this information? You know, there, there is a report out there, and it's based off of, like, you know, the growth of the, the area. And one of the things it did say about the New Orleans report is that the city lost, you know, so many jobs. In ter we're so tourism-based, and the city lost so many jobs during the pandemic and then got them back when things opened up again. That That is, you know, it's not the only reason, but that is certainly one reason why the big jump in growth for the city of New Orleans. Okay. Meanwhile, the recall effort continues. The recall effort is continuing. Uh, you know, they're, 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 it, it's, a, it's a tough road to, to ride, and you know, yeah. we'll see. Do they have any duty to recall people to report honest numbers? They do not. They do not. Just a, a theory. They, 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 do, they do not have any. They, I mean, ethically, yes, but, but they, legally, they, they, don't legally have, they do not they, have to. They, they, they do not have to report anything to us. Okay. The only thing that they report is if it's over. You know, they have to authenticate the signatures. All right, Lee. We'll, All right. we'll be looking for more. Thank you. All right, thank you. Don, over to you and some really disturbing facts and figures. I mean, very disturbing. Me mental health issues with our young people. This week alone in Louisiana, a 14-year-old boy and a 15-year-old boy that I know of have committed suicide. It's just horrible. Um, which is just horrible. In the state of Louisiana in 2020, which was the most recent year for statistics, two, uh, 600 people in the state committed suicide. Nationally, it's a person every 11 minutes. So there is definitely a mental health crisis, not just here in Louisiana, but kind of nationwide. Um, the folks at the Louisiana Department of Health say our children here in the state really have a double whammy rolling out of COVID right into Ida and the issues that Ida created for so many children. And the lack of access to resources and good mental health resources, not as bad here in the city of New Orleans in the rural areas, it's really hard. Um, children who are suffering or teens who are suffering are depending really on primary care physicians who aren't necessarily trained in the mental health aspects of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, Na nationally, nearly 10% of high school students overall commit suicide or try to commit suicide every year. In the state of Louisiana, that number is even higher, and it's definitely higher among African Americans and um, members of the LGBTQ community and females. So the state is looking to, to do whatever it can to try to bolster support for teens and youth and the adults who are struggling with mental health issues. The state is, has rolled out the 988 phone number campaign. Instead of a 10-digit mental health crisis mm -hmm. suicide prevention hotline, it's just a three-digit number, 988, and it's going to be statewide with trained resources so that people have access to it to a mental health therapist very close to them, and kind of bigger, right away. Big response to that. Huge response to it. Um, and the goal for 2023 is really to make that number, the, you know, it rolled out in Ju July. The goal for this next year ahead for the state is to make it, it widely known. There are media campaigns getting ready to hit, um, but it's 988, you can call it 24 seven and, and get access to help. Um, they say, you know, it's, we, it's, in the state of Louisiana, we're dealing with lots of things that are going down. Uh, children living in high poverty areas, low birth weight babies, children and teen deaths overall, overweight kids. We don't know, you know, there's a story out today that a child, one of the children who committed suicide was being severely bullied. We don't know why that child was being bullied. Um, you brought up before the show, is it social media? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a combination, the mental health experts say, of everything. that. I think for years we're going to be studying what COVID and yanking children from their normal routines and taking them out of school and f 
keeping them stuck at home with nothing, what that did to their mental health. I mean, I have three pretty healthy children, but I've seen the impact it had on them. I'm sure, mm -hmm. Lee, you have yes. with your kids, too. It, there are definitely, I mean, and there are impacts to, to we adults, too, sure. but we can handle them a little bit better. The, the youth in our society are really facing a struggle, and the numbers just aren't pretty. So 988. Um, 988. Parents can call if they Anybody have a concern the state, about their if kids. If you're concerned about your kid or your neighbor, if you're concerned for yourself, it. It is your immediate access to a mental health expert. It's just three digits. You just pick up the phone and dial it. All right, Don. Thanks a lot. Right over to you. You are a documentary maker, and you've made some documentaries about some real tragic events that have happened in our area. And this latest documentary that you you're looking into is the um, the Ralt Center fire. Now there there are those out there who remember that a high rise fire. And we watched women who were trapped in the upper floors. They were in a beauty salon trying to survive and actually jumping. So um, I'm going to, first I'm going to cue to a, a quick excerpt of your documentary and then we'll talk to you about what more you found out. Let's take a look. She told me they hung Wilma out the window and told her to kick the window in underneath and they were going to try to swing into that floor and go from there. But while we watched the fire, all of a sudden the windows started popping started blowing out way up high, boom, like explosions. And the glass was flying all over and people were screaming and the firemen yelled, all oh, you people get behind that fence. Downtown New Orleans, what, in 1972. And we were just horrified to see what happened. Tell yeah. us what you found out. It was the week after Thanksgiving and it happened at 1.30 and right in the middle of the CBT on people's lunch break. People were shopping, Christmas shopping. A lot of people, like the, 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 my dad was actually on his lunch break. He worked at Nopsy. He, he's in the video. So it was a tragedy that impacted many, and many people saw it. It, it appeared in the national news. Uh, it was just horrific. And as I mentioned, there were a number of women who were trapped in a, in a beauty salon and were just begging for help, and actually some did jump. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there there was, the ladders could not reach right. that high, and that, that was the big problem. They're, they're asking, like, why didn't they use life nets to catch mm -hmm. the victims? And they said, they, they explained it, the, the fire department as physics, that they would have broke through the nets. So some good things have happened because of that. Uh, have you been to many birthday parties right now? There's a bounce house where the kids jump up and down. Well, that. John Skurlock, he actually invented the safe walk space, uh, the safety air cushion that can catch people falling from like 20 stories. Hmm. Hollywood stuntmen use it all the time. And that also led to sprinkler systems. We became the first state to enact sprinkler systems mandatory by law in 1975 in high rise buildings. And so um, I saw that you interviewed, there was a, you know, in that quick clip, we see an interview with a gentleman who was a witness. Were you able to find any other interviews with witnesses? Definitely. Uh, there was like a, a lieutenant, of uh, Eddie O'Brien, who was right on the scene. He went to the room, actually, where they were trapped. And he said by the time they, they were so close, but mm. it was just a little bit too late. Um, and I, I, like I said, I can... Um, I can remember seeing the reporting of this, and my memory is kind of fuzzy on it. I can't recall whether we were actually seeing live coverage of it, because back in 1972, that was not an everyday thing to see live coverage, you know, several hours, or whether the news operations just extended their news coverage of it and that we saw film. But that's an image that just never goes away. Somebody who was around and, and can remember that time from 1972 in New Orleans, it, it just sort of stays with you. you yeah, know? most people say they saw it on the 5 o'clock news, but Eddie O'Brien, the, the fireman who was like on the scene who went into the room, he said that the door was slightly left open, and if the door was closed, it would have prevented, it would have contained the fire in that hallway. Mm -hmm. So if, it would have, if they would have closed, shut that door, they broke the window, to try to escape, escape yeah. but that may have caused a, that caused a backdraft. Right. But if it was closed, it may have been contained in the hallway. That's what the lieutenant said. Now on the clip, there it looked like, a, was it a woman who was hanging out the window or was it a, a firefighter? What, what, that what was, was that? 
Yeah, that was Wilma Williams. She worked in the beauty salon, and they were trying to get into the second, the, the lower floor mm -hmm. below that. And unfortunately, a lot of people say they jumped, they jumped, they actually fell. They mm -hmm. didn't, they slipped and fell. If you look at the video closely, she slips and falls. Mm -hmm. The other victims, they slip and fall. It's, it's all there in, in, the, in the, the, the video. And this happened just a little bit before the Howard Johnson incident, also in downtown New Orleans, where we did watch that live coverage. Yeah, the, uh, the Howard Johnson's was January 7th, mm -hmm. 1973. This was with November 29, 1972. Yeah. And so we'll be around the, a month later with the Howard Johnson, which was right almost right around the corner from where this was. So two major worldwide disasters uh, happened during that time. Right, and just uh, horrible to see. Did they ever right. cause, find out the cause? No, no, I mean, they, they think it's arson because there was a fire earlier that morning at eight o'clock in the morning, there was a fire that was reported in, in the Ralt Center fire hmm. in the Lamplighter Club and the NOFD said that they put it out but then later, 1.30, there was another huge fire. Mm -hmm. And then you had the Howard Johnson sniper case that happened 39 days later. And there was fire in there. There was too. fire in there too, and the similarities in how they looked, the fire. So. Okay, well, where do we see this documentary of yours? Will we have a chance to see it? Yeah, you can see it at the East Bank Regional Library okay. in Metairie uh, on the anniversary, the 50th anniversary. Okay, Jefferson Parish, East Bank Regional Library on November 29th. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks a thanks. lot, Rod. Okay, guys, time for other stories. E. The city council this week got $3 million more from a federal fund to help people pay their utility bills. They'd gotten $2 million earlier, but this is uh, uh, another payment. And, and now that they're working out the procedure, but there will be a procedure for people to apply. Okay, great. Lee? I'm just going to say we're, we're uh, expecting some more records to come in from the uh, city of New Orleans related to the mayor and all of this stuff. And keep watching because we may have more, some more stuff soon. All right, we okay. will be. Roy? The screenings of the documentary, November 29th, the 50th anniversary at the East Bank Regional Library in Metairie at November 30th, the next day at the library in Destrehan at 6 p.m. and then December the 3rd, Saturday, 1.30 at the Movie Posters Archive and Gallery in Gretna at 605 La Palco. Very okay. interesting place. Okay, thanks, Roy. Don. Department of Health warning as we're getting ready to gather for Thanksgiving next week that the flu is early and vicious in the state of Louisiana. So if you're not feeling well, don't go. Don't go mm -hmm. out and maybe <laughs> don't go, don't poison your whole family with maybe, the flu. Maybe go get the flu shot. Yeah, that, yeah that it's might probably too late bit. to get protection for Thanksgiving, but it's still not a bad idea. All right. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Great discussion. Thanks so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us too. And we will see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. <laughs>